Okay, so my name is Brendan. I'm part of the WAND Network Research Group at the University of Waikato in Hamilton, New Zealand. And this is some of the work that I've been doing lately. I spend a lot of time working on AMP. So before we start, though, this should move to the next slide. I don't know what's happened there. So I'd better clear up what AMP is about. There's a lot of collisions in this namespace. It's a pretty popular name, apparently. We should have maybe picked a different one. Um, but I'm not talking about a unit of current. I'm not talking about a guitar amp or a single amplifier. Uh, I'm not talking about an Australian insurance financial company. Uh, kind of relevant, Apache MySQL PHP. That could be useful, but I'm not measuring things with that either. And the accelerated network pages that seem to be pretty popular these days, little mobile things. I'm sure you could do some great measurement with them, but that's not what I'm doing either. When I say AMP, I'm talking about the Active Measurement Project, which is a project to do active network measurement, I guess, if I'm being clever. So what that means, though, active measurement is, at its most simple, is putting packets onto the network and seeing what happens. So we, you've probably all used ping or something. You've used traceroute. We've done a speed test. We blast some packets out, we see what happens, we measure how quickly they work or how many we can put through. So usually we're measuring end-to-end -end characteristics of the network or we're measuring what the host at the other end has to say to us. Um, and if we're measuring end-to-end, -end, maybe we're measuring how quickly, so the ping, your ping test, how quickly can we put a ICMP echo request packet on the network, have the other end respond to us with an ICMP echo reply. Or if we're doing a throughput test, maybe you know, how much data can we put through in a small time period or a large time period? How much data can that link hold? Um, if we're interested in load balancing or anycast or content distribution networks or something like that, maybe we hear who actually responds to us. Where did we go? Which data center did we talk to? Was it the best one? Was it the closest one? We'll measure that and see what we can, see what we can get. Uh, or maybe we care what the other end actually had to say. Maybe it's a DNS request. We want to check what address we got back. We want to see there's something, something there that they have that's interesting to us. We'll measure that instead. Uh, so one issue with this is all this traffic is extra traffic on the network. These packets are purely for the sake of measurement. They're extra. They're not normal everyday traffic. And if we do too much of this, we can interfere with the network. If we're running speed tests all day, other users might get a bit upset that the links are full. And our other measurements, too, that we make, our latency tests are going to get higher and higher and higher if we fill up buffers and things along the way. So there's a trade-off there between frequency of tests, how much data we're doing in these tests, and actually having the network be usable for other people and for ourselves. So we have to be careful there. Um, compare this to passive tests, so passive network measurement, where we just sit there and we just listen to what's already on the network. We aren't generating anything of our own. You've probably used TCP dump or Wireshark or something like that. Those are all examples of passive measurement. And there's lots of cool things we can get out of passive measurement too, but not today, we're not talking about them, it's all active. So that's what active measurement is. We're measuring networks by putting packets on there and seeing what happens. Um, AMP is a system to do active measurement in a continuous and distributed fashion. And so what this means is continuous, it's always running, it's performing measurements 24-7, it's not in response to us realizing the network's down and we should start doing some diagnostics or something interesting has happened and maybe we want to start collecting data to find out more about it. It's just always there. It's always running. Um, it's not always putting data on the network because we've scheduled it so that our tests are at an interval that's useful to us without, having, without overloading the network. But it's there. You can look at it after the fact, before the fact, or during. The data is there. You don't need to remember about it. Um, it's also distributed, which means it's running in multiple locations around your network or around other networks. It's not a single point of view. We can combine measurements from four or five or however many monitors you have all around the place to one destination, and we can see if there's any issues there. We can pinpoint which links perhaps have issues by following the paths that all these distributed monitors take to get there and just get extra information about what's going on. So we're testing from multiple places to multiple places from around, uh, from around the network. Uh, the next part of AMP is the data exploration. So we've collected all this data. We need to be able to look at it. There's a web interface, which you can browse through with the graphs. There's dashboards. You can see what's going on at a glance. And then there's also raw data interfaces, so you can fetch the data 
into your own tool, whatever you want to look at it in, and then see what's going on there. Um, and then the third part here is event detection. We try to take the data feed as it comes in and see if we can spot anything interesting that's going on. So that way you don't actually have to look at all the graphs. If we're collecting hundreds of thousands of targets, you're not going to look through all the graphs in a sensible time. So this hopefully points out, this one here is interesting, you should look at that. This link's got high packet loss, something's fallen over here, and it'll direct your attention towards the things that are most relevant. Um, so a little bit of history to start with. The AMP project, in some shape or form, has been around for quite a while. Uh, it was originally a National Laboratory for Applied Network Research and LANA project um, in California, and it was headed by Tony McGregor from New Zealand. Uh, in the late 90s or mid 90s, the American government was putting a lot of money into funding high performance computing in the universities and then providing networks so that these high performance computing centers could talk to each other or other universities could access this data, access this compute resource. And so when they're putting this much money in, they wanted to know that the networks were working and that they were actually getting good return on their investment. And so there's a couple of these networks sprung up, the very high speed backbone network service, the VBNS, and Abilene Network by Internet2. And in the beginning, these networks had a really, really open measurement stance. They wanted all sorts of measurements on there. They wanted to see different things going on. And so there were app monitors running on there. There were um, Planet Lab machines on there performing measurements. They made available all sorts of syslogs and um, so routing data, SNMP measurements. There was everything you could get off these networks was available for you to look at because they wanted it public. It was public money. They wanted lots of measurements to make sure it was all good. And so in 1998, the first probes were installed on the VBNS. These were installed on sort of 45 to 622 megabit links all across the states. Um, maybe not high speed these days, but that was, that was cutting edge then. They were later in 99 updated to two and a half gigs around the place, and probes were put onto the Internet 2 network as well, which was two and a half gig. And then these networks increased in speed up to 10 gigs plus these days. Um, and at its peak, there was, the aim was to have one amp probe in each high performance center and picked around 160 probes, spread across a lot of countries as well. And mostly these were in research and education networks or high-speed networks in other countries too. So there's a bit of a map there that's just across the continental United States in February 2000. They're all universities. They all test to each other so that every path on the network is being measured in multiple ways. And you can make sure that there's, there's good connectivity between all sites. Um, so when those machines went in, they were pretty powerful, state-of-the-art, 400 megahertz Pentium 2s. Um, they were running FreeBSD because that's what, they were, that's what they were using at the time for these probes. Um, as I said, they all tested on a full mesh, and so they were testing ICMP latency from every point to every point, as well as trace route data so that they could try to see what was going on, uh, try to figure out which links were at fault, perhaps, if there was poor latency data coming through. There were throughput tests available. These are run on demand because running a full mesh of 160 nodes to each other, doing throughput tests at any rate was going to be prohibitively uh, costly on the network. But that was available too. Originally, these scripts were all shell scripts, a bit of cron, a bit of bash, a bit of TCSH, running system tools such as ping and traceroute. And they were sort of cobbled together, wrote the data to flat files and sent it around using SCP and rsync and things. It wasn't the state of the art, but it got the job done and it gave them the data that they wanted. This is later rewritten in C. Um, Lynx became a primary platform as that became to be something that we were interested in using as well. And it, it, it slowly evolved, it slowly changed throughout, throughout its life, adding a few tests, becoming even more stable and so on. Um, funding actually ended for that, that version of AMP in 2006. The NSF stopped paying for that and the measurement of the HPC stuff through AMP and the machines were all decommissioned and they slowly just disappeared. They're all turned off um, in the United States now. Um, we picked up AMPLO, we carried on. Tony was at our university, interested in keeping the software being developed, and so we, we moved on, moved ahead on our own version and measuring our own networks. So we learned a few lessons from the first few versions, the initial versions in C, the initial versions in script stuff, and we thought we'd take advantage of these as we move forward. So the first one, in the beginning, there weren't a lot of libraries we could use. There were 
it was pretty quiet at the time and a lot of things were re uh, implemented ourselves from scratch. We had our own versions of protocols to move data around, of message queuing, and we bit-packed everything ourselves into messages that we could uh, deal with later then. So we've moved away from that and we now try to take advantage of tools and libraries that are a lot smarter than us and that they do good things. So we use RabbitMQ now as a message broker. We use protocol buffers to put our, put our data in and send it around. Um, we use a database now rather than using flat files to store data in. Um, and this, this is an ongoing process too in that when we started, Postgres was really our best option for a database. There wasn't a lot there we could put things in, but we've got Influx has come along now and we've recently moved to Influx, which is a nice time series database. It makes using our time series data a lot quicker, a lot easier than it is with Postgres. We still have some data in there. And we're still looking at new things as they come along. We really want to move to something like Grafana or one of those nice new shiny web interfaces. At the moment, it's our own graphing, our own JavaScript. And that's, sort of not, that's not our, our forte. So if we can find something really good to display that on, then push all our data through it and make our measurements available that way. Um, we also moved away from using processes with a lot of shared data. It got messy very quickly. Everything now is wonderfully nicely separated, uh, sorry, threads, everything's now wonderfully nicely separated processes. They don't share data between them. They're self-contained and they do their work and it crashes a lot less. Everything's much more stable. We can keep track of what's going on. So as part of the rewrite, we added tests to infrastructure targets that weren't part of our mesh. So we're no longer testing site to site and monitor and monitor. We're now testing to interesting and useful things on the internet, DNS servers. We want to know how close they are, are they working, are they responding to us? Um, testing to web servers, are they actually up? How long does it take us to fetch something from them? Um, and so this has been deployed around New Zealand now. We've got monitors across most of the country in various ISPs, universities, um, research networks, and they're, they're keeping the job on. The data's all there publicly, much as the original AMP was. People can look at that and see how the network's performing. There's also two or three ISPs, at least, I'm aware of, who are running some of this internally. They're monitoring customer connections and core connections and using that to make sure that their data, uh, their network is, is running as they expect. So in the current tests, we have some basic tests that measure latency across ICMP, across um, TCP, UDP. We do a DNS test as well across UDP. Uh, we do trace routes. We do TCP throughput, much like you know, iPerf and everything does as well. Uh, we download HTTP uh, websites over HTTP, including parsing the page, fetching extra images and things, doing all the DNS lookups, so that we can make sure that we fetch all the content and see more of a proper view of the thing. And we've just recently started doing video streaming YouTube tests, and so that's a test properly using Chrome, fetching data as Google would want you to do it, and not just making up numbers around throughput and latency and claiming that we can probably support video streams. Um, as we've gone on, those later HTTP and YouTube streaming tests, we've started to think more about the user experience. And so in the beginning, everything was raw numbers. We're measuring latency. There's a round trip time of 20 milliseconds there, or we can put 100 meg across that link there. And these are really good numbers. It's nice to know what your network's actually performing at. But when you start using software, when you start introducing people into the mix, sometimes they interact in weird ways. You know, we've got web servers, uh, web browsers prefetching pages. There's all sorts of extra DNS queries going off maybe we're not aware of. There's things get messy when you start using what the when you start seeing what the user is actually doing and not looking at the pure numerical view of the network. And so we're trying to trying to move towards that. Use the same software or at least the same algorithms that the user is using. We're looking at, you know, VoIP tests bashing a whole lot of packets together in a, in a nice rate, kind of like a VoIP test. It's better than a standalone latency test, but maybe we want to actually start using some VoIP software too, get a good view there. The original HTTP test was just sort of like a W get or a curl. It fetched the front page and timed that. That's not what users are interested in. They fetch now that nowadays hundreds of objects from tens of servers all across the world. So maybe we need to act a bit more like one of them as well and do multiple threads, uh, multiple parallel connections and fetch them all simultaneously. Um, and as we said, using the YouTube test, that's now actually running within Chromium. 
And so it's exactly like what the user would experience, and we can measure that. Um, so yeah, the raw network numbers, bits, bytes, milliseconds, whatever, maybe the user doesn't understand that, but they do understand my YouTube video spent 30 seconds buffering in the middle of it, and I couldn't watch it, or I can only watch 1080p, I can't go any higher, I can't watch 4K videos. So we're trying to put them in, in ways that the user can understand, hopefully. Um, so the new AMP client is looking something a little bit like this. There's the main process which runs a scheduler, and that has a file on disk which tells it when tests should be run, how often they should be run, where they should be run to, and with what arguments, and that's responsible for spawning the processes that perform the tests. So the scheduler starts up, runs everything. When the test is meant to start, it'll spawn the process, which is then entirely responsible for its own measurements. It'll send its packets out that it needs to send, it'll measure the ones that it gets back, and then we'll report that back to the server using um, a protocol buffer message in an AMQP stream to Rabbit. Um, so there's also another process down the bottom which is listening for messages from other Amplet clients because some of these tests can't be run standalone. We can send an ICMP test to a web server or to a DNS server or whatever, it's probably gonna reply if they've got ICMP turned on. We can send a DNS request to a DNS server, it should reply. But we can't send a throughput test to a DNS server, or we can't send a throughput test to a web server. So we need some assistance there from another one of our probes running our software. And that's, that's the way that that can ask another probe to start the server for it. So please start me a throughput, throughput test server. Yes, here's the server, and then we can run the test between these two endpoints and report the results back. Um, there's also a mechanism for the scheduler to get updates on the fly change the schedule from the central location. So when you put those together, we've got a whole bunch of AMP monitors on the right. Circles there, they're all what we just saw previously, testing to popular websites, CDNs, doing all their, all their tests that they need to do. So all their data comes back into the report queue, which is run by Rabbit, and from there it's stored into our database system. Some of it's in Postgres, metadata's in Postgres, some of it's in InfluxDB. That's all then made available through the website. There's a graph browser there which will fetch the data back. It will aggregate it. It will filter it down slightly so that's usable. It's a lot easier to understand that way. And coming off that database, we then have a pipe of the raw data which runs through an events detection system, hopefully trying to point out the interesting things for us to find, for us to look at there. Um, and there's also the management interface just down the bottom here which lets us update schedules, give probe configurations. And so the server and the probes all, all work together. The server manages the probes, the probes report the data back. We look at the website, look at the data. Um, just mentioning the web interface, here's a view of the nice matrix dashboard. All the cells in the grid, we can see sources on the left and destinations on the right, and the cells are colored according to the latency. So that's an ICMP latency test. So we can see, for example, that gcm.googleapis.com is a little bit far away from everybody. They've all got red performance to that, but most other things look very close. So we've got Akamai's and Apple and Cashfly and everything. You can see at a glance that the performance is, is nice and green. We can see the dashboard for the events. That's what was happening the other night when I took that screenshot. There were events uh, mostly up and down latency and we can see that they're also grouped. Rather than having hundreds of events come triggering in one by one, we try to group them based on what the destination was or common links that they shared along the way. And so I've opened up one there to westpac.com.au, which I thought might be relevant. The latency's gone up, not by a lot, but it's gone up, it's become a lot more variable there. So if we click through on one of them, we can see raw latency graphs, see what's going on, and we can flag, the, flag whether the events occurred that's sort of a, a smoke ping style graph where we can see, see the level of the latency and the shading helps show the measurements that were aggregated into that to show the distribution across that. But that's the sort of thing we can do with the web interface there. Um, um, while mentioning the event detection, it's all time series data, which is fairly well understood for, for event detection, but not necessarily running in real time or with the sort of data that we've got. Lots of things will detect events over a long time period. Um, they're less, less accurate if you're trying to do it over a short period usually, and it's no use to us finding events 
three days after they happened, or whatever. We want them to happen. We want the events straight away as soon as they arrive. So there's a bit of a trade-off there between, a, between techniques. We run some aggressive short-term ones, we run some longer-term ones, and then we munch them all together and hopefully we get something useful out at the end. The data fusion techniques mean we can, we can aggregate, uh, take the results from multiple detectors and then determine whether there's an event that occurred there. Um, yeah. So I thought briefly, seeing as it's a Linux conference, I should point out a few things here that are cool in Linux that are helpful to us. Um, you probably already know a lot of these, being a Linux audience, but we'll see how we go. Um, so the first one is familiarity. It's no use working in a system that you can't stand, you don't know. You're a lot more productive if it's a place that you're comfortable. And so that's one of the big reasons I think that we chose Linux is we were familiar with it and it worked for us. And that should probably be a good guiding thing unless you've got real other technical reasons that you, don't, that you can't use whatever you prefer to use. Um, it's open source, so we can change anything if we want to change it. We can fix, understand why things are working the way they are and reason about the system. So that's helpful too. The kernel is actually really good for input measurements. There's a lot of support in there. And because there's a lot of people contributing to it, it actually can move fairly fast. Something that somebody comes up with one day, it'll end up in the kernel pretty soon and be available for people to use. So that's really cool. And low hardware requirements generally as well means that we can run these on little cheap boxes. So they save power, they save money. They're good for everybody. One of those kernel features, um, that I mentioned the support measure measurement came originally out of the Web 100 Web 10G projects. I don't know if you've heard of them, but a long time ago, um, networks were growing in speed very quickly and TCP performance was lagging behind. And these guys really wanted to uh, put some more visibility into the kernel. They wanted people to be able to get it TCP state and then reason about why it was slow, tweak the knobs, change the values, and um, just generally improve TCP. And so, they contributed a whole lot of patches to Linux. They were originally entirely separate. You'd have to patch your kernel, you'd have to run your own thing there. But over time, these have slowly made their way into Linux. And so lots of these knobs, lots of these tunable variables, lots of these statistics are now just there by default. You can look at them, and that's thanks, thanks to these guys. Um, lots of the data they've added is in the TCP info struct. We can see things like original TCP configuration for the flow, um, window sizes, MTUs and things. We can see latency estimates that TCP is using to, um, to guess timeout values, estimate timeout values, and we can count packets and bytes. And really cool, we can look at time spent not sending and reasons why. We didn't have any data to send for half the time we were working, that's why we were slow. Or the other end hadn't dealt with the data so the window was closed, window was small. So that's really helpful, you can do all sorts of core measurements with that. Also, Linux kernel gives us some pretty good timestamping tools. Um, if we set SO timestamp, we can get receive times on packets as they arrive at the kernel. It's a lot better than trying to wait till it gets to user space and making up our own timestamps for them. We get them when the, the timestamp of what the kernel saw them at. Um, even more recently, I've not actually used SO timestamping yet. It's on my to-do list. But now we can timestamp outgoing packets, we can timestamp incoming packets, and we can do it in hardware if we have supported hardware too. So that's the next step up, that's even better than waiting for the kernel to get it, that's when the packet arrived at the interface. And I think BSDs and everybody's got SO timestamp, but SO timestamping's Linux only, brand new, pretty shiny, it should be good. Um, so it's gonna change direction slightly now. Um, this is one of the things I've been working on most recently is the YouTube test I keep talking about. So this is running in Chromium, this is one of the things that everyone's been asking for us, ISPs have been wanting to measure YouTube performance, whether that's the CEO, that's what he knows, or that's what the customers have been asking, that's what the customers complain about, I can't watch my videos. And so, started implementing this and ran into a few dead ends, and here's a little bit of a story about some of those dead ends, I guess. Um, so the plan was, I want to use Chromium to run on its own, perfectly normally, and fetch YouTube videos. We can get exactly the same experience as the user's getting, we can see see what the user's seeing and what they're complaining about. Um, so it, it connects perfectly normal to, to YouTube, it fetches data from the servers that Google tells it to, it fetches data at the rate tells it to, at the rate Google tells it to, because there is some application flow control there, 
It's not like a YouTube downloader where you download as fast as you can because you want your video now. It tries to drip feed the data so that if you stop watching the video, there was no wasted data transfer and there's no point in sending faster than you can actually display the video. So we want to behave just like a browser and follow all those rules. And at the end of it, if we can report some interesting statistics that have meaning to both the user and the ISP or the, the person running it, then that would be great. If we could say, how long did it take before you could start watching the video? What was that initial buffering? How many times did you buffer while, while watching that video and how long were they for as well? Or maybe, yeah, what's the maximum resolution you can watch without buffering? So that was the goal of the test. So there's two parts to the test. The first part is a nice simple web page that uses the YouTube iframe API. And so that gives us access to all the events that occurred during the video playback. We get a little JavaScript event that says the video size changed or we started buffering now or we started playing now. And so by watching all those events, we can add up the time we spent in each of them and then put it together into a nice, nice data structure at the end that says this is how long everything took. And the second part of that is we have a Chromium instance that talks to that, that fetches that web page, which then fetches the YouTube video, performs all the stats and brings it back. And so we have a, a C++ application which is using the Chromium headless libraries and that's responsible for fetching that and then turning those results from the JavaScript into C++ so that it can then report those results back through to the server. So there's a bunch of automation tools, there's things like Selenium and headless Chrome drivers and things which we could have used to run, run a standalone instance of Chrome and then tell it what to do and fetch the results back. That would have been fairly simple, but we decided to do it the hard way um, because it was there and we also wanted to use this for something else later. The HTTP test at the moment is a custom sort of browser emulator. It, it has parallel connections, but it doesn't really behave like a real web browser and it can't do JavaScript. It can't parse pages out of that and things too. So we want to use a real browser. And I thought this would be a perfect test bed to practice for that on. So modern web browsers have a, a or modern JavaScript implementations have a performance navigation timing object, series of objects which give really cool information about DNS lookups, download times, time spent blocking, which you might have seen in the waterfall graphs that show, show how your objects are going and when your page was finally loaded and what parts took so long. And so that's the data that we wanted to get access to, except that you can't use that data for cross-origin objects. So if you download a web page that then has extra libraries, you won't get the timing from those other libraries or those other images unless you set the magic header flag. And generally, that's not set because then people can check those timings and tell if those are in your cache or not. So there's a privacy issue there that people don't want websites to know what other websites they've visited by trying to see if images are cached. Um, which is fair enough. But for my purposes, I know that it's all my data. I don't care if I look at my own data. I want to be able to force the flag, force that header on all of my packets that come in, all my objects that come in. So eventually the plan is to override that within the Chromium network stack, which I can just override in the C++. I can pass it in when I build my new Chromium browser, which I haven't got working yet. But that's why I took all these difficult steps in the first place was so that I could eventually override that and then have timings for all my web pages. Um, next, uh, uh, along the way, I ran into a few issues with Chromium. Firstly, it's, it's big and it moves quickly. I picked an arbitrary version. It came out whenever I, whenever I was started, first started on this project and tried to build it. Um, my build environment didn't like it. GCC got unhappy. I went back a few versions so I could find one that worked with GCC. Built that found some other bugs that, and eventually I was trying to cherry pick bugs off, uh, cherry, pick packs, uh, cherry pick patches from random places and it all sort of fell apart. So I couldn't keep up with that. Um, shared libraries too, there were a lot of them that changed names between versions, they disappeared, they came up, it's, it's just always growing and changing. So I decided, uh, the, the headless libraries too, they're also quite new. Some of, the data, uh, some of the symbols I wanted to use in my Chromium headless code, they didn't actually exist in the shared library. They were sitting there in random, random .o files somewhere in the file system that I had to start finding. So I was including them in the build as well. But they're, they're moving towards actual libraries too now. So the, 
good answer was to anchor myself to Debian and Ubuntu. I'll use their versions. I can take their build scripts out of the packages. I then have something that I know works. I use Debian, I use Ubuntu, I can build it in my environment, and it's, it's, there. it's the same as what other people are using too. Um, the other problem I had was that the tests on AMP are loaded at runtime in, as modules. They're not compiled into the whole thing. They, they're loaded so you can include extra ones. You can restart it and get, get all the new tests added to it. And so I had my main program was linking against libssl. I had my Chromium test, which was linking against libboringssl. And at some point in time, I tried to call SSL functions, but they were the wrong SSL functions with the same name. And eventually it would crash at some point quietly without really telling me what was going on. So I had a few approaches there. I had to play around with um, opening those libraries and namespaces so that I could try to keep them separate, but I needed to have the same code calling both bits so that wasn't going to work. And it would have limited myself to only a few tests as well. And that DLM open only gives you 16 16 namespaces. So there was a, would have been a limit of 16 tests. Um, so in the end, the right result was to split the behavior across multiple programs. So I now have the one program that AMP runs, which has libssl in it. It uses that to report the data back. And then that forks off into the Chromium process, which has libboring SSL and reports the data back. So everybody's happy there. Uh, along the way as well, I also found that Chromium forks itself a lot. When you first start it, it will spawn off another process and then keep that around as a, as a static base so that it can then fork other ones, having already done all the startup work and also making sure that if the base binary gets upgraded underneath it, when it forks, it's actually forking the right version that it thinks it is so it can communicate internally still. Um, what this means though is that if I'm running it as part of my AMP system, it tries to fork and it's not forking Chromium, it's actually forking to AMP again and AMP doesn't understand the Chromium build, uh, runtime flags, and it doesn't actually act as a web browser. So once it started, once it forked, it all sort of fell over again. I had a quick play around trying to cheat, trying to replace what it thought it was by editing, uh, playing with some proc entries. You can change uh, proc self exe using a, um, that command there. You can replace it with any other file, and it will fork into that. Um, but unfortunately, that only worked on my Docker and didn't actually work on a real machine. I couldn't free up all the memory that was tied to that correctly to do that. So again, splitting it across multiple programs just like before solved that issue too. So when it forked, it was actually forking into its own, own program that could understand web browsers. So I don't have any useful graphs of the YouTube stuff. It's still coming along. I haven't made any to put out yet. But I do have some other interesting graphs that that I thought I'd show you. It's actually really difficult trying to find really broken networky things, even though it's often broken and you see all these big events. When you actually sit down to find them, I can never remember where they are. But here's some interesting things that hopefully we can see. So first of all, the internet's getting closer. This is ICMP latency from all of our probes, one probe per line to Akamai across the last four years. And we can see that it started in 2014 around 140 milliseconds. So we're talking west coast of the United States or something that we're getting our Akamai from. Uh, then in 2016, it's all being served from within about 20 milliseconds of where our probes are. So most of the probes are in Auckland. You can see that's probably the very, very bottom line through there, looking at you know, sub five milliseconds but then there's others spread around the country. So that's the, your 10, 20 milliseconds as you're getting down to Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin, where the other probes are. So Akamai's really good. They've brought everything into the country. It's all nice and quick. We're no longer going all halfway around the world to the United States to get our data. Um, again, we're getting closer. This is Cloudflare. So Cloudflare looks like they started already in, the, in Australia. They're only 30 milliseconds away, Australia's pretty close, that's pretty good. But then they decided, let's bring this closer again. And so in 2015, we can see that, um, again, we're getting sub five milliseconds is probably Auckland's, Auckland nodes testing to our Cloudflare servers that are in Auckland. And then as the latency goes up, we're looking at Wellington, 10-ish milliseconds, you know, Dunedin, Christchurch down there. So, you know, the, the big internet, used to be all based in America, is now it's creeping closer to us. Lots of us in New Zealand, it's all really good. We can access all these websites that are on these CDNs really quickly, really closely. 
And it's, that's good to see. And it's something you can see that you've got long-term data. Sometimes they don't quite reach New Zealand. Um, Facebook started out 150, 200 milliseconds away. Not too great, somewhere in the States probably. And then over time they've got closer. 2016, some sites started picking up Facebook in Australia. 2017, a few more sites joined them as, as pairing changed or as, as new, things, uh, new things came around. And so they're in Australia now, they're still 30 to 50 milliseconds away, that's pretty good. It's not too bad, they could be a bit closer. Um, usually we're in Australia. So Google looks like they too started out in Australia. And then 2016, a few of those moved to Auckland very briefly. We had very good uh, latency to them very briefly in 2016 for half of our probes or so. And then they moved back to Australia. Everything still seems to be served from Australia now for most of the Google, Google web stuff. Um, there's a few odd, odd things in there. There's a, at some point for a half the year or so, one of those probes ended up being served from somewhere that was 300 milliseconds away for Google. So it's all DNS, it's all CDNs, there's all magic going on there. And so probably somebody along the way, their DNS server was picked up as being from the wrong country or the wrong organization. Somebody started using the wrong DNS servers or just the magic back there. Something fell over in the magic and then they end up getting 300 millisecond latency to Google. Um, Sometimes things move around a lot, even though they don't move very far. So this is from Waikato, which is in Hamilton, to trademe.co.nz. And we're seeing it moving there from visiting Auckland, really close, to visiting Wellington, slightly further away. Um, that's just, they've got a really low TTL on their DNS, and so every time we perform a new test, we do a DNS lookup, and sometimes we get the Auckland, Auckland node, sometimes we get the Wellington node. And that's just the load balancing between those. But it's very frequent, looks a bit odd, but it doesn't seem to matter too much to us. Um, the path between those, the AS path between Waikato and Tremi doesn't actually change in that time though. So each of these blocks, each of these colors is an AS, an autonomous system that the path has taken to get to that site. And so, we can see there that it's all the same across the, the time period. The colors would change in the vertical stack if it were to change uh, which organizations it was visiting. And so it's, it's still going Waikato, our upstream provider, their upstream provider, Trade Me. It's not bouncing around the world through, through other um, multiple, new, multiple new ASs. It's still within just the local stuff. Um, sometimes we see some quite big differences between IPv4 and IPv6. Usually they're pretty comparable. Sometimes you've got your v6s slightly worse. It's generally getting pretty good though. But sometimes odd things happen and so here's an example of that. What we're seeing here is DNS latency from a machine in Iraq to a name server that is in Iraq or two over. It's very close and normally they're in the order of fractions of milliseconds, but for some three or four hours there, IP, IPv4, uh, IPv6 latency just kept on creeping up. But I'm not sure on what actually happened there because the v4 latency stayed exactly the same. And the ICMP latency stayed the same for all of them too. It's only DNS IPv6 that increased there. So unsure what's actually happened there, but it's very interesting and it happens every couple of weeks between this this pair of sites, and only this pair of sites. Um, I, flicked, I flicked the NZRS a, a quick email the other day, and they said they'd have a look at it. It was very interesting, but we found out what, what the cause of that was. Um, just to look at that from a slightly different view, that's that same graph again, DNS latency, but it's on a log scale now, so you can see the, what the baseline there is. There's actually some V4 traffic there. It's normally fractions of a millisecond. But that's, that's quite amazing, that. Um, but yeah, weird things happen all the time. And somehow the internet just sort of keeps on working. You, if you can spot the weirdness, if you can see these things as they're happening, maybe you can do something about them. You can fix the network link that's failing. Your optics that are dying, you can replace them. You can fix the pairing that's 
meant you've gone the wrong way around the world to the target. You can fix the DNS server. That meant you've ended up in 300 milliseconds away to get to your Google or whatever. But you need to have the monitoring there if you want to see any of these things. So, you know, monitoring is important. We need to be looking at that data. We need to be acting on that data. So, if you're interested, if you want to, if you want to host a monitor, if you want to have your own deployment on your own network at home or at, at work or whatever you're, you're managing, get in touch. I have time. I can be on the email. You can let me know, and I'll help you get it set up. I'll help you make everything go, get it all running, and get some pretty graphs. Um, if you've got ideas for tests, let me know what you've got. I've got time. I can try to add them to it if they'll be useful to you. Um, and there's a couple of URLs there if you want to get in touch or if you want to have a look at the data or if you want to look at the code, contribute something there, then feel free to have a look. Um, and that's it for me if we've got any questions. No questions? just want to know if you run throughput a test like in a continuous way or at least uh, yeah and how do you solve a problem of of having a full mesh and being the pipe being busy if you do so so at the moment all the tests are scheduled uh, we tell them when we want them to run manually so we say run this test every minute and then we we offset those so that we make sure they don't collide with throughput tests and, and things like that. Um, ideally, in the future, there'd be some, some smarts around that. So we could say, I want this test to run as frequently as we can. And I want it to avoid my throughput tests in the order schedule. But we have to pick the offsets ourselves. I think we can uh, say thanks very much. Very interesting. Thank, thanks for doing it. Doing it. Watching our, our, our net for us. A small token of appreciation from the uh, our conference. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>